people know if Motown was being ran by Barry Gordy when the DeBarges came in. And I know it's the fucking DeBarges. I hate you, Nunez. Always coming over here trying to correct me about something. We know it's the DeBarges, but we call them the DeBarges over here. <laughs> In the last week, in June 1975, Barry Gordy's vice chairman of Motown telephoned Joseph Jackson with a bombshell. Motown owned the name The Jackson Five. The group could leave Motown, Joseph was told, but they would have to leave the name. Jackson Five would stay behind with the company. Now, I did a video before on this, technically the name didn't belong to Joseph because remember, um, Joseph was calling them the Jackson brothers. And then he met this pretty model at the mall where the boys were performing. And she said to him, don't call them the Jackson brothers. That sound old. Just call them the Jackson five. So they went to Motown with the Jackson Five. It was, who was it? I forget the name of the dude, y'all know, that said, let's use the numeral five. So technically, it didn't belong to Joseph. And Joseph, you ain't the only Jackson family in town. What are you talking about? Joseph demanded, according to his memory, we came to Motown as the Jackson Five. That's my family name. It's more than your family name, Joseph. I don't know if you came here as the Jackson Five or not, Michael Roshkind told him, but you're sure not leaving as the Jackson Five. I can tell you that much. Ooh, remember when we read uh, Sugar Ray's book, Raynoma Gordy Singleton? Is Michael Roshkind or Ralph Seltzer the one who got kabonged in the head with a guitar by Abdullah? Or is it Abdul? I forget. But one of them jokers got hit in the head, okay, for having a smart mouth. What the hell do you mean, Joseph asked? The fact is that there are probably 40,000 people named Jackson running around this world. Okay, touche. We made five of them stars. We can find five more if we have to. And we can make them stars too, Roshkind said. Ooh. Why you son of a bitch, Joseph exclaimed. He slammed the phone down. As it happened, Clause 16 of the Motown recording contract, which Joseph had never read but had signed in 1968, stated, It is agreed that we, Motown, own all rights, title, and interest to the name The Jackson Five. And that's why these artists don't be screwing around with these labels no more because of foo shenanigans like this. You know these people is illiterate to the literature in them contracts. Ooh, the devil. Furthermore, to ensure the company's ownership of the name on March 30th, 1972, after the Jackson 5's first string of hit records, Motown applied to the United States Patent Office to register the logo Jackson 5. The name Jackson 5, spelled out 5, and Jackson 5, the numeral, were also exclusively owned by the Motown Record Corporation. Of course, Joseph could have registered the names Jackson 5, Jackson 5, numeral, and any other name he wanted to hold on to had he only thought to do it. There was another family meeting. What do we do now? If Barry owns the name, he owns 
the name, Michael said, according to his memory. We don't have to be the Jackson Five, do we? I mean, can't we just be the Jackson family or the Jacksons? We might not have a choice, Joseph said. It might make me sick to lose the name, all the work we put into it. And you know damn well that they ain't going to use it, grumbled Tito. It'll just be wasted. But let me say this. <clears throat> it worked out. Because ultimately, the Jackson family is a brand, not the Jackson 5. Because there was a time when the Jackson 5 were actually working with six members at one time. So it worked well. On Monday, June 30th, 1975, Joseph Jackson arranged a press conference to announce the family's new affiliation with CBS. With over eight months still to run on the Motown contracts, Joseph seemed more eager than ever to leave Motown, you know. This is around the time that Bird of Gordy round there working on the mahogany. You know, that didn't do well. That did not fare well at all, honey. Honey, I guess he thought he could do with mahogany what he did with Lady Sings the Blues. Oh, answer no, Barry the Gordy. And remember, Barry Gordy was down there pissing that director off, so then he had to step in and do it wrong. Earlier that morning, Barry had one of his lawyers send a telegram to Arthur Taylor, president of CBS Records, warning him that his company had better not host a press conference relating to the Jackson Five since Gordy had exclusive rights to ensue authorized publicity. When Barry learned that Taylor planned to ignore the warnings, he sent him another telegram warning him that he'd better not refer to the group as the Jackson Five at the media summit since Motown owned exclusive rights to that name. Jackie explained that the group referred to that afternoon as the Jackson family was signing with Columbia because Columbia is an album selling company and albums is what really makes you known touring okay all right we, we'll stick with that we'll go with that jacket when asked if the group had tried to renegotiate with Motown he answered yes but the figures they was just Mickey Mouse after the press conference Barry Gordy filed a lawsuit against Joseph Jackson, the Jackson Five, and CBS, seeking $5 million in damages for signing with CBS before the Motown contract had expired. Joseph countered sued, claiming Motown owed the family royalties, unpaid advances, and expenses. Now, we know that's not true, okay, because you know the way they worked it out. Remember in the beginning? Uh, you want to pay us for everything, you know. Even if you in the studio singing Mary Had a Little Lamb and we do not release it, you are still going to pay for Mary Had a Little Lamb. So by the time it was all done, the Jacksons owed Motown quite a bit of money. Now, it was some bullshit, but it is what it is. I mean, Barry the Gordy. He put it on paper. Take a little for myself, and it's because of you that love won't let me wait. He owed Motown money, for by the terms of their contract, the Jackson Five were liable for the cost of all of the songs they recorded for Motown, including the ones that were not released. To say that Motown had kept the boys busy would be an understatement. Michael Jackson and the Jackson Five recorded 469 songs for Motown in the six years from 1969 to 1975. That's about 75 songs a year, which is astonishing considering that this isn't all the boys did for a living. However, taking the boys away from Motown and to Epic would not 
later be cataloged as one of Joseph's mistakes. If not for Joseph's decision, Michael would probably have ended up an obscure showbiz act relegated to Las Vegas lounges and not major showrooms either. There is little doubt in the minds of most music historians that after moving violation, the Jackson 5 would have stagnated at Motown in much the same way other groups who had stayed after their heyday did, such as the Supremes after Dinah Ross left for happier trails. I don't know if Motown was being ran by Barry Gordy when the DeBarges came in, and I know it's the fucking DeBarges. I hate you new niggas. Always coming over here trying to correct me about something. We know it's the DeBarges, but we call them the DeBarges over here. And I think after, I think Motown had great success. Success with the DeBarges. Even though El DeBarge said he lost his mind working for Motown because they stifled him so bad and he couldn't do it. He was around there working like a damn horse and wasn't seeing no damn money. El DeBarge said that Barry Gordy or Motown drove him to alcohol. Remember, El DeBarge was the only clean and sober one. And then he started losing his mind and started popping pills like the rest of the DeBarge's. I love Ayo. I love you, Ayo. I even love Chico. I love all them junkie debarges. I love them. Damn. Jermaine may have at least found some shelter in the arms of his wife, but other members of the Jackson family seem to be growing more antisocial, shunning exposure to people outside the gated estate. I don't date, Latoya told me at this time. I don't trust people. To be honest with you, I have no friends. It doesn't bother me. When I get lonely, I read the Bible. I thought to myself, what a shame. She has to be so leery of others. She also said that she rarely went out in public unless she was with other family members. She expressed no interest in marriage or raising a family of her own. I would never bring a child into a society like this. I respect it. Now, I, I wouldn't want her to bring a child into the world either because I think that Latoya is, is not the brightest bulb. Hell, I ain't the brightest bulb, but that's why I don't have a child. You know, I got Lou, but I mean, Lou be taking care of me more than I take care of him. It was as if the Jackson siblings were being raised to mistrust all outsiders. When Jackie started having marital problems, Joseph was able to point to such discord as evidence that outsiders can't be trusted. Enid Jackson filed for divorce in September 1975, nine months after she and Jackie married. You see that? Joseph told his sons. After just nine months, look at the problem Jackie got on his hands. The couple reconciled and would remain married for 11 more years. Then Marlon dropped a bomb in January 1976. He had secretly run off and married someone four months earlier. While the group appeared in Las Vegas, Marlon married an 18-year-old fan from New Orleans, Carl Parker. The ceremony took place on August 16, 1975. He hadn't trusted any of his brothers with the news because he was sure they would tell Joseph. He didn't want to go through what Reby Tito and Jackie had gone through with parental opposition to marriages. And he also didn't want Joseph and Catherine to know that Carl did not sign a prenuptial agreement. At a time when he should have had enthusiasm for his life, and career, Michael Jackson was on the verge of hopelessness and despair. You say that you love me.